Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. It's another beautiful, wonderful morning, friends. Once again, welcome to the Porter's Gate online broadcast. If you're out there once again joining me this morning, well, we want to welcome you. I want to welcome you to another live broadcast. It's cold here in Johannesburg, but we want to believe God this morning that we'll be able to press into God's word and look into the mind of the Lord for our lives, for our day. Well, of course, for a while we have been you know, dealing with the issues of the signs of the times. And, you know, Jesus was rebuking the Pharisee. He said, you are able to read, you know, the, the signs of the sky, all right? You are able to look at the sky and you're able to predict that, well, it's going to rain today or it's going to be fair weather. He said, how is it that you are not able to understand or predict the signs of the time? In fact, he said, how is it that you are not able to read the signs of the time? And to me, that is such, you know, a powerful, you know, a, a, a word that, you know, has drawn my heart to so many, uh, you know, thoughts and uh, kind of also readjust, you know, my perspective and sense of understanding and sense of what we need to do, how we need to engage, you know, the seasons that we live in. Of course, it is clear that the Lord wants us to be spiritually educated I don't want to go back to that scripture, but you can find that, of course, in Matthew 16. It was a sharp rebuke that Jesus gave, to, you know, to you know, to the to the Pharisee. He said, "How is it that you are not able to read the signs of the time?" And I think that is something that the church needs to focus on. Like I said, you know, uh, the the manifestation of the eclipse is not just you know, a voice to the nation of America. It's a voice to the entire globe, to the entire world, to the entire Christendom. And I thank God that we are seeking to look at what God is saying, what God might be saying through that major sign to help us to readjust, amen, realign, reconnect ourselves, you know, if you will, to be more, you know, uh, committed and be more resolute in what will allow us to be able to read the signs of the time and reading the signs of the time is not just limited to some if you will prophetic you know phenomenal meaning, meaning that we should be able to read the word of god know what god is saying amen know the heart of god know amen the the the, the sense of you know the emphasis of god for for our day for our life and it's in, in that line that some of the things that we have been talking about, remember, we've been dealing with the general topic of occupying till Jesus' return. And in that concept, we've been able to kind of divide, you know, uh, that topic into different. In fact, I didn't divide it. It's just as we continue to talk about it, the Lord begins to open different channels, different emphasis different focus okay that we need to understand in terms of being able to occupy because to be able to occupy till jesus return then we need to be able to do what read the signs of the time and if we're able to accurately read the signs of the time that of course then gives us the edge okay so reading the signs of the time also requires that we're able to read the mind of god we're able to understand we're able to know what the spirit of god is saying what the spirit of god is emphasizing what is the now word man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that what that proceed from the mouth of god so what is the proceeding word what are the current emphasis of God for his church, for you and I as the body of Christ, for you and I as watchmen, amen, as, as watchwomen, amen, as leaders, as disciples of Christ, as followers of Christ. What are we supposed to be tracking? What are we supposed to be, you know, pursuing? What should be our priority in the scale of spiritual preference? So if you have been following, you will notice that these are the things that I'm trying to track, I'm trying to understand that we're not just preaching and teaching and just saying things, you know, as we feel, no, that we're following, we're reading the signs, we're reading like the sons of Issachar, we're seeking to understand where is God in this season in time, what are his emphasis, what are his demand for us, what is he calling me, amen, into as Isaiah Phillips, 
What are the things God is pointing at in my own life that he wants me to commit to, to emphasize more on, all right? Yes. What are those things that I am not, you know, proficient in, in terms of, you know, being able to read, being able to develop, being able to work in that sense of, you know, kingdom, you know, education. Because we know that God is speaking. And like we have been saying, if God is speaking, somebody needs to hear my sheep hear my voice, all right? A stranger's voice they will not follow. If God is speaking, how is he speaking? Are we used to, amen, the voice of God? Is he still speaking the way he spoke to us, you know, some decades ago? Is he still emphasizing the things he emphasized three years ago? Or has he shifted, all right? Is he pointing us to something else? Is he directing us to us another, you know, you know, uh, 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 you know points, another emphasis? You know, at seasons, God has emphasis. There are things he's coming to say to us, to bring us into that. As we respond, we grow, we develop, amen. We move, amen, in the, in the, in the, if you will, in the ladder, in the, in the hierarchies of, amen, our walk and our journey. We're on a journey, we're migrating, we're going somewhere, amen. Blessed are those who sat as set on a journey. Psalm 84, blessed are those whose heart are set on a journey. Amen. So in this journey, God comes and then he speaks to us. Now, of course, the last eclipse we saw was, was not the first one. There's been several and there will be more several coming, making demands, speaking to us, giving us, yes, clarity and insight, pointing us to what we need to. May may have seen that eclipse. All right, and they might have gone wow, rejoicing and celebrating, and it's just entertainment to us when we see that when those mages, when those wise men saw the star, amen, they knew what that meant. They said, Ah, wait a minute, a king today has been koshalabayada. A king, they've not seen the king, they don't know where, but by the fact that they were able to look at the star, they knew what that meant. Just think about that. When they saw the star, they knew they could give interpretation. Even though the interpretation was not, you know, 100% clear because they went to, all right, the palace. They could not imagine that, yes, a king is born, but a king is actually born in a manger. How can it be? How can a king be born in a manger? If a king is born, it should be born in the palace. So you can see that even in our being able to read the signs, if we're not tracking with God, we may also presume. It is that little leaven. It is that little presumption that sometimes could de derail us. So, in that which God is saying, we need to have clarity of heart. We have, we have to continue to wash ourselves. Amen. We have to continue to do what? To wash ourselves daily. And this is the point and place where the issues of, you know, sanctification, all right, comes in. I'm just giving you a kind of, you know, a, a framework of where we are today. All right. You will notice that I've been focused for a while. I've not done, you know, a few broadcasts now for, I think, for two days thereabout, but I've been focusing on what is the essence of, of, you know, of the, you know, of the, of the sign. How do we read the signs? I've done an, you know, an article, I think for about seven, eight pages, which you can read on my blog post if you want to, you know, looking at what that sign is to the nation of America, how God is, how God has used that sign, okay, to, to call to awaken, amen, they, they, you know, they, 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 the watchmen on the wall, okay, so when we talk about the prophetic, it's not just about, uh, uh, you know, just declaring what, we have to really internalize what God is saying, and, and because that also will come with a level of warfare, and all kinds of dynamics and realities that, you know, that, that will be shaping, you know, uh, uh, what we are talking about, because that sign speaks to us of something more internal more spiritual the battle is more spiritual okay that a, a, a day of darkness is coming you know a time of there's an eclipse that is coming all right 
and, and we must not be looking for some physical, you know, external thing. Whatever we see in the natural and the physical realm should be amen understood within the context amen because the real enemy amen is within us the real attack the real darkness that is going to be covering the earth amen is is seeking to penetrate the heart of men so if 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 we really are going to survive and move further into the mind of God, into the will of God, into the intentions of God, then we have to continually, amen, track the voice of God. And it's for that reason, okay, that I want to say this, that, you know, in the, in this topic of the Chronicles of Christ's Disciple, I want to focus more on the issues of really being a disciple and what it means to be disciple. All right, what it means to be a disciple, and you know, and, and how to be disciple, or the process of being disciple, because you know that Jesus was able to leave, Amen, his, his work, his assignment, when it was done to people, all right, to people that he had what disciple, that the, before they became apostles, before they became prophets, before they became, you know, uh, you know. Gatekeepers before they became shepherds, all right, they were first disciple, and I think that is, you know, a word today that is almost been extinguished, almost been relegated, been thrown behind, been left behind in our so-called journey and walk with God. I feel God, Amen, is calling us back. God is calling me back, all right. That this is the time to to revisit, Amen. All right, the, the, the ministry of the, because it is disciple that will give us, if you will, the 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 the, the root that, that will allow us to be rooted, amen, in and, and being established in Christ. And that is what we need if we are not gonna be blown away by the wind, if we're not gonna be veiled, if we're not gonna be you know eclipsed by amen. Yes, the the, the, the present darkness and the ones to come. Somebody listen. So we want to be, amen. We want to be, want to be truly disciple, and we want to debunk some of the ideas and the theologies and maybe wrong teachings and imbalanced teachings. Okay, that have been, you know, emphasized on this point. We want to know what it means, amen, to be a Christ disciple. Remember, it is being a Christ disciple because that is where we will be able to function in other sphere of our assignment before they were sent out they were first amen disciples and the first thing we read I think was in Matthew 10 or thereabout the Bible says he called these people to himself so there is there's gonna be that you know concept of really developing a personal relationship again with Christ because it's from that point that first of all we'll be able to you know resist and stand against whatever the enemy is going to be doing in trying to frustrate or hinder our assignment and calling all right you know in Psalm 23 the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want <clears throat> I shall not want he makes me to lie down yeah in green pasture he restores my soul. I like the part that it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not like it's not going to happen. We're going to walk through many valleys of shadows of death in this end of days. You like it or not? You, you can't wish it away. All right. As long as you're breathing and as long as you're migrating, you're moving towards the place of God's purpose and plan for your life. You will pass through many tunnels, through many you know pathways that will be defined as, yes, the shadow of death. But the, the good thing is that amen, the reason why you will not be afraid is because you know that he is there with you. I think that sense of assurance, we need to really pay more attention to that. We need to grow in that. We need to really groom ourselves in the realization. Because I tell you friends, as we proceed further, there will be seasons of loneliness. There will be season, you know, here, some of the things I'm going to be dealing with on this platform, on this, you know, session called the Chronicles of Christ's Disciple, we're, go we're going to be really, you know, drilling deep. We're going to be talking about real things. 
This is not just going to be words passing your head because we want to be shaped. We want to become. Amen. We want to be transformed. It's, it's on this level, on this point, amen, that the idea, all right, of Paul saying, I travail in birth until Christ be formed in you becomes manifest. Traveling in birth is not just limited to prayer and you know that we do a lot of that. In fact, our ministry is, is built, is established, amen, on, this, on, the, on, the, on the philosophy of biblical prayer, kingdom center prayer. But there is more, amen, to our walk with God than prayer because the word they gave in Acts 6, 6 is we will give ourselves, amen, to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You can't separate these two. You want to grow, you want to be proficient, you want to mature, you want to come into the full stature of Christ, which is where we are aiming at. These two must coexist in our life. They are like the apostle and the prophet. You can't separate them. They are husband and wife. Even though these days husband and wife have been separated. <laughs> you understand? But you get the point that I'm making. They are intertwined. The prophetic and the apostolic are intertwined. It's not just an office you wear and bear and you go around and say, I'm a prophet, I'm, a, I'm an apostle. No, it's a spirit, it's a life. And that is some of the things that we are, we've began to focus on when we started this teaching, remember, a few weeks ago. I said, God is calling us to the ministry of life. And if you read the scripture that is scrolling down, all right, you will see. What Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we are called to be ministers of life. So all of this is helping us, is giving us, if you will, a framework. We, we, we are being built up. Remember, the body is built, is built. If it's built, we need wise master builders. Hallelujah. So at the end of the day, we want our life to become, you know, a mirror of the life of Christ. That's the point. And that's why I'm flagging this, you know, a description before you mirroring Christ's life through amen your own lifestyle that is the end product of a disciple and this is why amen we call it the chronicle of a disciple of Christ what you have learned what I have learned what we are learning what we are becoming hallelujah our experiences you see the experiences we are gathering in the journey. Sometimes we are also going to talk about our failures. Where are we failing? If we don't talk about our failures, if we don't talk about the areas that, amen, we are being defeated, how can we, amen, encourage ourselves, you know, to become strong, to become, you know, fervent, to become one that is indeed, you know, uh, uh, seeking to want to change. If we, if, if we don't, if we don't tell ourselves the areas that we are failing, it then it means that we are not what we are not honest. Honesty is one of the characters of truth. All right? So, in these, we will be dealing with issues of Bible study. Okay? There's going to be a lot of emphasis on Bible study. But this Bible study is not just going to be to study Bible for Bible for studying Bible's sake. All right? It's going to be Bible study, Bible lifestyle. So, what we read in the word of God will become, amen, the mirror. Remember, that's the, that's the whole essence. We want to be able to mirror Christ. But you can't mirror what you don't know. You can't mirror what, amen, you've not given yourself. You have not offered yourself to know, to understand, to become. You see what I'm trying to do? I'm, I'm, I'm laying down, amen, a, a, a foundation and I'm giving you, amen, a framework of the objective of what we want to achieve, amen, as Christ's disciple. I didn't say as Isaiah's disciple. I'm not saying as some church disciple. I'm not saying, you know, talking about you belonging to one group or organization. God, as much as we need to build, amen, yes, you know, a formidable assembly in this end of days, and we need to know what that assembly entails, but we also need to understand that, amen, unto him shall be the gathering of the people unto Christ. So when we understand what Christ is, who Christ is, what Christ expects of us, what Christ demands of us, amen, then that gives us, amen, clarity into the kind of materials, if you will, the kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, Petrus 
that we need. Petros, amen, are pebbles. Petra, amen, is the massive rock, like I, you know, I will always define. All right? And I'm really looking forward to a time God will give me the grace and really release me to start building some, you know, Petra and Petros out there. I'm looking forward to it. I didn't want this before, but I'm really, really looking for to, to you know towards that. So maybe you're out there. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Maybe you're out there and you want us to do something in terms of something on ground where you live. You understand? Build something, a house fellowship. A house. We I'm putting materials together that you know one can use because I think that is the next thing, the next emphasis of God amen, for my own life. That yes, we want to move this thing beyond just an online thing. We also want to put boots on ground. We want to be able to help people, pray with people, encourage people, strengthen people because I tell you, crazy things are happening in the life of Christians today. Things that, I mean, we cannot even begin to talk about. People are falling here and there. All kinds of things. People no longer, you know, want to even try, you know, and, and just push themselves to want to live for Christ. And I understand that, okay, yes, there have been so many reasons and circumstances because of that. But now God, amen, is returning to us and is giving us clarity and direction. So those are some of the things that we want to do. So in case you want, you, you've you got a place you out there, you want us to partner with you or you want to say, well, please, Isaac, what can we do? I want to start a house fellowship, a home church, you know, a gathering in my community. All right. Can you assist? please let me know. You can reach me because those are part of the things I feel the Spirit of the Lord is really drawing my attention to. Okay, we have to build an alternative to this massive thing that is dying, that has been eclipsed, that has brought confusion. Men are groping. Christians are beginning to grope in darkness in noonday. They have, they've lost. They are, we're losing. Let me not say day. We are losing our sense of direction and instruction. Passion and fire is dying. So we want to build altars. We want to build altars where the fire of God, amen, will continue to burn day and night. Yes, you can make your house. After all, you know, the, the, the presence of God, you know, the ark of God was brought into the house of, uh, 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 what's, that, what's that guy's name now? And the, the Lord blessed his house, you know, you know, that priest. After they took the ark of God, yes. You understand? David had to take the act there. They, and he, I mean, God blessed his house. So this is not about some, you know, just, just let us know. Anyhow, that is just by the way. Let's continue. So I, I, I'm, I'm saying God wants to bring us to a point to a place, all right, where our sense of strength and direction, amen, yes, is focused to us building, amen, discipleship. And we want to do that, amen, by looking at the Bible, studying the Bible. And of course, we can't do all of that in few, you know, minutes that we always have online. And that's why I think, amen, <clears throat> there should be an extension to what we are talking about. It could be anywhere in the world. It could be anywhere in the world. The facility to do that, amen, has been laid for us. We need to know how to make use of technology. We can do online meeting. We can, you know, and, but physically, I would love to come to places, at least if it's within South Africa, you know, even if it's, I remember when we began in Cape Town, I was in Johannesburg. I mean, you know, every month I used to just fly down to Cape Town. You know, sometimes you, you know, you just take a, a, you know, a bus to Cape Town and the people were gathered, people were hungry and we used to come there and just impart the life of the people. You understand? So hopefully the Lord will allow us to be able to do that again in some community. It could be in, it could be in uh, KwaZulu Natal, it could be in God knows where, amen. But we, I'm willing, amen. Yes, it could even be in your church. You said, well, I need my church to move. We were doing that in, in you know, a, 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 when I was in Johannesburg, yeah, we, you know, churches used to invite us. They say, "Come help us to build. Come help us give us clarity and direction." What is this thing about the apostolic we're talking about? We did a lot of all of that. Okay, so that is something we want to look at. Let's quickly, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's look at Matthew. You know, Matthew sixteen. All right, Matthew sixteen. This is a scripture we use. You know, back. You know, a few weeks ago to establish some points in relating to what we're talking about. Please don't forget the context of what we're dealing with, all right? God gave us a word last year. He said, all right, you need to build a church that can occupy till he returns. 
and I see that as a huge responsibility. Maybe because of my kind of prophetic sense of understanding. I look at what that is, okay? That is not just about going to church. There has to be a strategy put in place. There has to be, amen, a, a, a principle, an objective that you are working with, okay? There has to be a vision, amen, that is giving you direction into how to occupy. And of course, there are di dimensions, areas, places, amen, that we need to occupy. But before you begin to think of occupying, amen, within, yes, uh, the, the, the financial system and the, you know, the entertainment system, I understand all of that. And yes, we need people in those areas. It has to be people that God has called, that God has commissioned, that right, they've got grace in those areas. We need to be able to find and locate the grace of how all right, to occupy so that you don't get occupied in that space. You don't get consumed. Because some other people say, no, God has called us to take the seven mountains. And the mountains have actually swallowed them. Because they were ill-prepared. So, my point here, first of all, is this occupation first must be internalized. Excuse me. <clears throat> this occupation must be first something, amen, that is within us, okay? If, if Christ has not occupied all of the areas, all of the desires, all of the, you know, passion, longings, you know, uh, aspiration, uh, whatever it is that amen, you are made of that is on the inside of you, if you have not got into the place where you have totally committed yourself, amen, the, the, the one of the key concept of disciple is you got to what deny yourself take up your cross and follow him so it's in the context of you, of you following him amen that your desire amen is shaped remember god wants us to have good desire after all he gave us amen the faculty to desire he gave us the faculty of will yes he gave us all of this but how do we amen in serving him, in working with him, that these things are actually offered to him so that whatever he desire or will for me becomes my desire and my will. So that I don't desire anything outside of his program and plan for me and then I'm still thinking I'm going to occupy somewhere out there. Of course, the enemy is going to be laughing at like, you, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. Are you getting the point that I'm making? Yes. How do we get to the point of relinquishing, relinquishing our expectation? Where, how do we get to that point where we surrender, where we have truly surrendered to him? Yes. Where, how do we get to the point where our idea, our orientation of Christianity and spirituality is not just about using God, amen, and using the tools and the resources is given to us that, you know, has been made available to make something, to acquire something for self. How do I live for him so that he becomes, amen, my, my, my resource, he, he becomes my fulfillment, that I can truly find joy in serving him, that whatever he gives to me, amen, becomes indeed my desire and my quest and my fulfillment. See, we have to, we have to balance these things clearly. You see, I, I'm trying to help us have a better and a clearer understanding of the mindset we need to have, the right orientation, amen. The right belief system is important, the right expectation, so that at some point in your walk with him, maybe after 5, 10 years or 20, 30 years, you don't get weary and get disappointed because we all, can get to that point. I have gotten to that point and God, amen, has query and question, you know, my expectation. All right? Yes. So that when you look at somebody like Job, when God begins to, in, you know, engage Job, after Job had gone through all he went through and he began to curse the day he was born. You understand? Thinking that he had the right, all right, to demand and to, to require of God why he must go through all of those things because he was a blessed man and all that he, he had been given including his family has been taken from him and he had to question and query God why would you allow this thing in my life why would you allow you understand all that I've worked for and all that I've acquired to be taken after all I live my life to serve you I was a man of prayer I did everything you wanted me to do 
Why would you allow this day? And he cursed the day he was born. Who cursed the day they were born? For you to curse the day you were born as a rich person, as an influential person, as one that you know you had assumed as arrived, means that you've been pushed to the end of the world. All that your life defines and expect has been taken from you. That is what I call the eclipse. That is a, the eclipse of our life. When what you define to be light and what you define to be prosperity and success and what you define to be security suddenly is eclipse. That's when the true thing, the true person on the inside comes out. And I've said this. And that's the crux of what I've been talking about when I talk about reading the signs of the time. The whole purpose of that eclipse and the whole reason why that eclipse highlighted on America is because God wants to break, amen, the pride of a nation. God, amen, is saying what you think you have and what you think you have achieved and what you think you know and, you know, the state and the status that you think you've arrived, I'm going to eclipse it. It's something to look for, to, to, to work for, and to be prepared for. And this was Job. Job got to the point in his life where his light was eclipsed. His sun was eclipsed. His day was turned to night. He couldn't handle it. This is what I call discipleship 101. When all that you thought you know and you've acquired and you've achieved, all right, and you have you know, gain and your idea of if I can pray X, Y, X, Y, Z time, if I can do X, Y, if I can do this, if I, I've done all the things they've asked me to do. So this should come out. You've got to understand that Christianity, your work with God is not a formula, it's a relationship. And in this relationship, all right, he defines and determines what is good for you. Can we really get to that point? Can we really accept that point that he knows the best and he wants the best for me? It is the desire of the Father to give you the best. And the best sometimes means denying you. Did you hear what I just said? The best sometimes is denying you. You know why he denies you? Because he knows better than you. He sees what you can't see. He knows what you don't know. He knows what is going to happen tomorrow if he gives you that thing. Just like the mom knows that if I give you another candy, if I give you another cake, I know you don't know, but I know that you're going to have, you know, a sore tummy. Your tummy is going to ache you. You've had enough. No, but mommy, I want more. But mommy will not give you more. Daddy will not give you more because you're not mature enough to have that thing. He knows that when he gives you that thing, because yes, other parents may give, you know, the same thing to their kids, but he knows who you are. He knows that when I give you that thing, that thing is going to cause you more pain. You may, you may have, you know, that momentary enjoyment, that momentary feeling, yes, like the prodigal son. But you want it all by force. You want it all by force. You want it all by force. I just need it. I must get it. You know why you need it and why you must get it? Because you're suffering insecurity. Because your security, all right, is, is dependent on what you have. What you have becomes how you portray and project yourself before friends, colleagues. And that's how they respect you. But that's not how God wants you, amen, to live. That's not how your father wants you to live life. He wants you to be authentic. He wants your life to truly reflect, amen, yes, an inner, an inner position of, of life and influence so that when people relate with you, they relate with you because you have substance, not because you have things. Things come and go. Are you, are you, are you getting the point? <clears throat> So, while, jo while, while Satan thought that, you know, Job amen, is, is what he is because of what God has done in his life, because of what God has given to him, because of the protection of God upon his life, 
that this is the reason why Job, all right, is so committed in prayer. This is the reason why Job is so committed, you understand, in fasting. This is the reason why Job is so committed in giving. Look at the things you've done for him. Who will not do, who will not do that for you as a reward, you know, as a gratitude? Job is basically expressing gratitude. Take this thing away from him. Remove the edge and see if this guy is not going to cost you to your face. This was... This was Satan's challenge. And God took on that challenge. Okay, we'll see. And that is the same challenge God, amen, is taking on behalf of many of us. So many of the things that we're going through that looks like, but, but I'm serving God. But I'm working with God. But why would the Lord allow such a thing in my life? I've been in that position too. I've queried, I've questioned God. And if you have not gotten there, I can assure you, you're going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody prepares you for that. You're going to get there. We're all going to get there. And how we come out of that will make us either a better, you know, follower of Christ or turn back. So these are some of the things that I'm trying to, amen, bring out from the idea of, you know, being a disciple. When we, when we talk about, you know, the chronicles of a disciple of Christ, all right? So I wanted to read a scripture in Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus told his disciple, if anyone wants to come after me, you want to come after me, you want to chase me, you want to follow me, you want to walk with me. That is the beginning point of what makes a disciple. A disciple is a follower of Christ. Not just a goer of church. Not just one who goes to church. Pardon my English. <laughs> All right? It's not just going to church. It's not just being a nice preacher. It's not just being, you know, a good singer. It's not just being a good, you know, intercessor. It's not just being, you know, somebody nice. It's not just doing the nice things of life, you know, being kind and being good and all of that. Those things are good and they can be the after result of being a disciple. But first, a disciple is a follower of Christ. And the question is, what are the ramifications of following Jesus Christ? What does it mean? What are the implications? What are the benefits? Or are, what are the, you know, intricacies of following Christ. Look at the word there. If, it's a big word. That word if is a very big word. If anyone, in other words, before you anxiously or presumptively or assumingly decide to want to follow, just like we, we do things sometimes without really sitting down and really truly counting the cost as, as Luke, you know, a uh, uh, 1428 says who wants to build a house who wants to go into an adventure into a venture into you know a, 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 um, an initiative into a battle into a war whatever it is that you want to do you feel you need to do you believe you've been called who goes into that without first sitting down to to really count to really look at what you have if indeed it's enough to finish it. It's the same, amen, call it. It's the same matter we have to address when it comes to being a disciple of Christ. It's not something we do, amen, uh, uh, haphazardly. It's not something we do out of zeal without knowledge. I'm saying this because you and I, I mean, we all know, see what's going on today in, in the world. We all see what's going on today in the body of Christ. That indeed, many are going to church. Many are bearing the name Christians. But many, in fact, are not disciples. Have not been disciples. And this is why I'm saying that one of the key objectives, one of the key mission of the third day church of the last day church, of the end time church, of the current, present, apostolic, reformational, whatever word you want to use to qualify where we are, who we are today, must return back to the issues of discipleship. It's a must. 
if we are going to survive the days ahead, if we truly are going to remain people that are, are awoken, all right, that are not caught sleeping, that the enemy does not sneak into our vineyard, that does, the enemy does not sneak into our lives. He doesn't come and sow all kinds of, you know, you know, tars and, and tissues. Like we've seen today, the enemy has invaded the life of so many. We're just basically going to church because we can't imagine ourselves going to join another religion. So let's just continue. Because we've not really counted the cost. We don't know what it means to be a disciple of Christ. You want to go on a trip and you have not really sat down and look at your fund, your funding. How much is it going to take me to America? You want to relocate and you don't have anybody all right, on the other side that all right, will welcome you, will take care of you. You've not, you know, book an hotel all right that you are going before you get to that country you already want to book your hotel you are already want to book your room you already want to be able to know all right you map out you know how things are which which state are you going okay yes w what is the transport you know transport system how does it work there you understand w what do they charge how much how much am i going to need for a day for food you understand yes do I have enough to be able to take me for the number of days, weeks, and months I want to spend there? Life is about planning. And this planning is to help you, amen, to guide you and lead you so that you, you, you don't run out of steam. You don't get halfway and you, you find yourself stuck on the way. So he, he says... If anyone wants to come after me, if it's not a must, and there is no becoming a Christian without following Jesus, the two work together. You cannot be a Christian right, without becoming a disciple of Christ. But you know, today it's so convenient to be to be a Christian. You can be a Christian and just become a member of a church. Just become a member. And if you have money, all right, well, as long as you can give money to the organization, wow, you'll be accepted. There's a difference between a disciple, a disciple of a church and a disciple of Christ. If the church, amen, is a true, amen, biblical-based church, then they, they will put it in the curriculum that as they are teaching and training and equipping you, all right, yes, to be part and to be member of their of their church organization that in fact indirectly you are becoming a member of a disciple of Christ a follower of Christ because that is what amen any church is assigned is commissioned to do the church is commissioned to go do what disciple the world you cannot disciple the world all right if you don't know whom you are discipling them onto what you are discipling them onto you can't be discipling the world onto yourself onto your own identity onto your giftings onto your image because that is what many are doing and it's for that reason today many do not have a man the wisdom of God, the life of Christ, the grace of God, the ability, the competency, amen, to fight and to resist and to reject, amen, the life. And it's for that reason many cannot identify when, amen, the church or the man of God or the woman of God had gone, you know, bonkers, have, have, you know, have gone the other side because they were never shown Christ. So when something else is being revealed to them, they cannot identify it. When something else is being preached to them, when a different gospel, a different doctrine is being emphasized, they can't identify it because they never knew Jesus. They never saw Jesus. It's when you know Christ, amen, that somebody then come and present something else different. You'll be able to say, sorry, but this doesn't, this doesn't look nice. Right, right. This, this doesn't sound like the Jesus I know. My sheep, amen, know my voice. A stranger's voice they will not follow are you see this is this is huge this is a this is a real responsibility we are calling to 
you know i pastor for many years and after the lord called me to move to south africa it was difficult for me to leave the people at the end of the day, i left them you know why because i know that i've left them in a good hand i left them in the hand of christ yes i was now irresponsible some of them we sent to different places, okay? There are churches that we know, go join them, you know, attend, you know, go connect with them, go, you know, decide. But the point is, I was ready to leave the people because I knew that was what Jesus also did. When he finished the work, three and a half years, he left the work for those, amen, he had discipled. And he was confident enough that they will be able to do, to carry on the work. How many churches today? How many leaders today are ready and willing to do such a thing? You've built a church for 20 years plus. You say God has called it somewhere else and you left the church. Not like you left the pastor there to be, you know, to be giving you, you know, a, 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 a report every every week, every 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 hour about what's going on. And the, and the offering is still coming to you. I'm just saying that we have to re-evaluate. We, we need to. Because the key to surviving, the key to becoming invincible the key to becoming you know strong kingdom based apostolic amen oriented community in this end of days all right is that we are building our lives and we are building amen our initiative on the foundation of biblical discipleship biblical discipleship that is beyond somebody preaching to you discipleship amen is is orientating is a deliberate amen orientating and reorientating people to live amen in a in a in a lifestyle in a belief system in a manner that glorify christ and as they glorify christ amen they in turn serve the body of christ and of course creation as the lord will ordain it's not the other way it's not you serving the church first and then you are looking for a way of how to serve Christ. No, 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 no. Your gift is not for the body first. No, your gift first is to Christ. Your calling first is to Christ. Your work first is with Christ. And in return, hallelujah, you work for Christ. I hope what we're saying is making sense. This is... At least what the Lord is dealing with me, is speaking to me about. And this is what I believe that we need to look into because that's my assignment to see that the church gets perfected, gets to be built up. Jesus said to his disciple, remember, they've already come to him. They were already his disciple. But yet, is like laying another layer on that demand. He said to his disciple, not to um, somebody who is just by the way, not just to some somebody who just got healed and got well excited. Well, Jesus healed me, so I'll serve you all my life. I will serve you. You 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 raise my 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 daughter from them. Well, I'm committing. No, it's not something that was done, you know, out of zeal, out of you know, uh, 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 um, you know, some idea of well this is what the lord did for me so let me do this they were not obligated it's not out of some obligation he said to his disciples they were already amen yes with him they were already following him he said to his disciples if any of you want to come after me you must deny yourself you know like i know that self-denial is the most challenging and the most difficult thing within the human space. Self-denial. And I know that, well, the, 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 the Eastern religion, they've done pretty well in, in the idea of self-denial. But even that, when you weigh that on the scale of righteousness, is nothing. It's filthy rag. It's self-righteousness. So that's not what we're talking about. 
that you can deny yourself of food for 40 days. All right? For 80 days. Guess what? It's because you want something. Not because you want to follow Jesus. People will deny themselves as long as what amen, they are going to get out of that self-denial is going to benefit them. That is how determined the soul is. The soul will make you do things that you will never think you can do. All right? Just because there is something you want to achieve. That's not what I'm talking about. When people make up their mind that they want to do certain things or they want to achieve certain things, you'll be surprised how far they can go. When a mind is made, made up about something, I mean, e.g., if, who would have thought that if would have actually plucked that fruit? You've been told that the day you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. Just think about that for us, you know, for a few seconds. You know the consequence of eating from that from that tree. You know. But you see, in her mind, in her thought, she said to herself, "This is a fruit to make one wise. I want to taste that wisdom." So all the devil did was just to find that, that desire. He found that desire into reality. He, he flamed that desire. And that's what the devil does every time we fall into sin. It's not like we don't know that we're going to fall into sin. It's not that we don't know that what we're doing, what we're about to do, all right, is going to lead us the wrong way. But because somehow we have developed a desire. And when there's a desire, there's a passion. So what the devil did was just to come and flame. He just poured more flame, poured, excuse me, poured more you know, fuel in that fire. in that, And she could not control herself again. The Bible says she took it, ate it, and gave it to her husband. Said, let's eat it and let's die. <laughs> that is what soulish passion can do. Soulish passion can make you fast for 100 days. That's because you know that after the fasting, you're going to become a millionaire. Don't ever underestimate the power of your soul when it comes to denial. I've seen, I've seen women as fat, I'm sure, I'm, please pardon me, I'm just giving a description. I've seen women as fat as this very fat out of shape but just because they feel all right their marriage is threatened by other beautiful women all right who are slim and they are getting close to their husband they put themselves into fasting until they're like this not because they really want to you know you know fast and you know and slim and have good shape because they want to feel good no they feel threatened when you feel threatened you'll be surprised what you can do what you are able to do when you feel you have nothing to lose again you'll be surprised and guess what that is the power the world system is tapping into you can do it you can do anything you can achieve anything just set your mind to it that is what they are feeding on. And they will tell you, well, I, I, I did this, look at, after five days, after 21 days, after, uh, wow. Check the motive behind what, they are, what they've done. Mm, this is a good one. This is a good one. When human beings make up their mind on what they want to do, nothing stops them. But even that decision is from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The key here is to deny yourself and follow. 
take up your cross and follow Jesus. That's a different ball game. That changes the entire equation. No, people don't want to deny themselves to follow Christ. They can deny themselves to get money. They can deny themselves to get a wife, to get a husband. They can deny themselves to get that promotion. They can deny themselves to shape up, amen, and look nice. They can deny themselves, you understand? Yes, to say, America, here I'm coming. Even though I've been refused visa seven times. I was listening to a guy. I think he said he, he had applied for American visa. If I'm not mistaken, did he say seven or ten times? I think it was maybe on the seventh one, the tenth one, they finally gave him. Can you believe that? Do you know how much you pay? All right, to the consulate that you can't get back. Then secondly, I'm wondering how is he able to do it? Because at some point, they should tell you, sorry. We, we, will, not, we, will, not, we will not, you know, uh, 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 look at this application because you've been denied. There must be a reason. So he must have been doing all kinds of things. Maybe changing his name. Changing, you know what? People will do what? When people are desperate. I'm just giving you a, a scenario. You see, at the end of the day, sin is a choice that we make. Sin is a choice. It's a personal choice. Because right, we have desired it. We have desired the fruit. We've desired the passion. We desired the thing. That is the power God gave to man. That power God wants you. That power to choose. He said, hang it on Deny yourself to follow me, not to follow something else, not to fulfill something else that you want to. And that is that thing that needs to die because if that desire, amen, to want to achieve and become something has not been, because look at, the, look at what they said. Deny yourself, take up your cross. If you deny yourself, but you have not learned to take up your cross, that denier is going to become something else. In fact, that denier is going to become a fuel. All right? That awakens another passion that is witchcraft, that is self pursuit, that is self focus. All right? And in fact, that, that denier can lead you into something else that you will begin to worship your own denier. You begin to worship the power. That's what happens to Lucifer. Lucifer was in the presence of God when he was cast down. It's amazing that while doing what we think is righteous and what we think is good, why are you fulfilling and seeking to achieve something righteous if that thing is not totally, completely focused in Christ? That thing itself that, is, that sounds spiritual, that looks spiritual, becomes an idol. You can idolize your, your own achievement. You can idolize your spirituality. You can idolize your righteousness. You can idolize your sense of fulfillment. You can idol see what God is doing in my life Be because I have because I have become. Oh God, help us. Are you seeing what I'm saying? You know. I'll tell you this, every time I'm able to fulfill something or do something, achieve something that I may have been trying to do, maybe finish writing the book, I've always noticed that that is the moment in time where the enemy comes to attack me the most. And you know, you know where he attacks? He attacks that sense of achievement. He attacks. If you don't know how to manage your achievement, how to manage success, how to manage prosperity, how to manage breakthrough, how to manage what else again? Whatever it is that makes you feel, finally, oh, I got it. If you don't know how to manage that, that itself becomes a leeway for the enemy to entrap you. That is why the next word after deny yourself is what? Take up your cross. The cross is an equalizer. Did you hear what I said? The cross 
is an equalizer. What the Lord did in the life of Job was to equalize him. Now, Job knew God from what he's been told, from what he's been, he, has, he has read, from you know, literatures and all of that, and from you know, him being able to give to God and God giving him back. He knew God from one dimension. And oftentimes, we serve God from one dimension. But God wants us to serve him and know him from all ramification. Job did not know a God that can relate with him from a place of suffering. <laughs> Job did not know a God that, that is still his father from the place of pain. From the place of need. From the place, you understand, where people then come to speak. People who naturally will not be able to even come to your doorstep. They come and look at you and they pity you. What kind of a God is that that makes me sore, that makes me sick, that's boiled all over my body? I, that when I walk on the street, people will look at me and just bow their head. They respect me, they honor me. Now I have to hide from people. What, what God is that? Nobody tells us the side of that God. Because the idea is when we come to him, our life is just going to mm, start blooming. Everything is just going to be nice and good. It's like we read the Bible upside down. <laughs> Maybe I should say inside out. It's like, it's like the things we see in the Bible suddenly don't apply to us again. Well, Jesus took it up. Jesus took it all. He took my pain. But the same Jesus said, in this world, you are going to have tribulation. You're going to have suffering. You're going to have pain. He said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. Why is it that when somebody starts hating you, suddenly you start feeling insecure? That is the reason why God wants somebody to hate you. So you can deal with that insecurity. God wants you to deal with rejection. That's why God creates all kinds of things, scenario around you that causes people to reject you. It's part of understanding discipleship. There will be times and days in your life where God will just put you in a state where you don't have. Why? Not because he wants to hurt you. But it is because he wants to teach you faith. You live in an environment where faith has become an estranged language. If I'm in need, I just need to get a credit card. Go to the ATM, go to the bank. They give you, put more money there so you can incur debt and incur it on behalf of your kids and your kids' kids. Hello? You can't take the pain, so you must just look for a way out. That even sometimes you have the means to get certain things, but you hear the voice that says, do nothing, say nothing, buy nothing. But you've got the means. Ah, it's my money. It's, it, who told you it's your money? So God is trying to help us grow us. And that's why I love discipleship. Can you see? We're just still on one on one verse. If anyone, if it's not a force, please, all those gimmicks. If you come to Jesus, he will do this for you. If you come to this, he will get you this. He will give you a husband. He will give you a wife. Do you know some of you may remain single till Jesus return? Because in his eternal purpose and plan, which you have not even sought to understand or bother to ask and say, but God, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on? I'm still single. Did you ever care to ask him if it's his desire for you actually to be single? I'm just saying, I'm pleading. You see, when you get to the point where you hear certain things and you're like, please, I don't say that. I don't want to hear it. It means that you have not fully trusted God. You know, one of the things I said to God yesterday, whatever you want me to do, Father, put the desire in my heart. Because you know, naturally, I will not want to do it. 
Humanly, I would not want to, but you put that desire in my heart. So, in case you want me to be single, put the desire. Just because at the end of the day, our life is ruled by our desire, isn't it? So, every time I see a woman around me, something in me just goes, no, 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 no. But if that desire is not there, when you see a woman, you may be thinking, maybe this is the potential woman. Maybe this is the potential, you know, man I need to marry. Maybe this is the potential. Because your desire is what flames your expectation. But when God puts a desire in you and says, sorry, it's not for you. Guess what? You won't even think about it. And if in that condition, God then decides to say, that's the man for you. Even though the desire was not there, suddenly he puts the desire for that person. You get the point. But when you hear something and the next thing that comes to mind is don't even talk about it because it does not align with my expectation, with my agenda. It tells you you're not a disciple. Oh, that's a good one. Because God doesn't give us things just because we are good and nice. God gives us things to facilitate his divine plan and purpose for our life. Everything about our life in the eyes of God are good and they are giftings. Everything about your life, where you are right now, that place you are, that state, that stage, that thing you have or you don't have, they are all part of God's program for your life. And if you learn to understand it and embrace it, when he sees that you have elapsed that period, that season, that space, he will upgrade you, whatever that is or means to him. This is discipleship. We don't clamor for things, run after things, pursue things, acquire things, gather things to make a statement. No, your life is already a statement. Your life is already a sign and a wonder. Are you getting this? We have to have an holistic picture, an holistic view. We have to have the right spiritual orientation. Why am I saying this? Because the days that we live in, as the darkness continue to come, as we continue to get eclipse, as our sun begins to, amen, gets to be blocked <laughs> by the moon, we need to know what to do. We need to know that we are at the right place. We need to know that it's all well. When, amen, at 12 noon, the whole world suddenly went blank. We need to know what to do. That that is the time where we need to surrender our will. Because that is what Jesus did. On the, on the cross, amen, he surrendered his will to him that is able to save him. Amen. He felt, amen, the neglect. Father, he cried, why have you forsaken me? Twice he made that statement. That is the only and the last time, amen, Jesus will make such a statement. Then one nearer to that was when he was praying in Gethsemane, if it be thy will, let this cup pass over me. At that moment in time, amen, when he was giving up, his, 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 his ghost, amen, knew that this is the only way out for human redemption and salvation. The Bible says, amen, because of the light, because of the light that was snuffed out of Jesus at that moment in time, because of course he couldn't have died with light, then he wouldn't have been able to save the world. That's a sacrifice that he needed to make. For the first time, he knew what it means. To be void of the presence of his father. God help me. He knew what it meant. To feel pain. To feel rejected. His father finally turned his face away from him. Because that is the sacrifice. To be paid. For your redemption and mine. And he voiced it out because he felt it. It wasn't the pain of the cross. 
It wasn't the agony of the nail. It was not the turn. The crown of thorns on his head. Amen. That pierced through his, his skin and skull that he was bleeding. That is not the pain. That was not why Jesus cried. It was not for the fact that he was stripped naked on the cross. No. It was for the fact that he could not feel the presence of his father. For the very first time, heaven separated themselves from him. We can only imagine the state of his mind. And of course, he said it. Father, why have you forsaken me? The only way we could feel, we could see, we could understand the impact of that moment is the Bible says that the whole land was filled with darkness. Eclipse. Maybe you don't understand and the sign of that eclipse I'm saying it to you again is a sign of things to come because we will also have our own share and time where we are hung on the cross it's symbolic Jesus died has died for all of us but we will live in a day where we will feel that point where all of your life your wish your expectation your desire and everything you think you have and you're hoping to achieve even in ministry in business is hung on the cross and you feel that you've been forsaken if you don't know who is in charge at that moment the enemy may want you to compromise you know what they said to him you who claim to be the king of the Jews. Why don't you why don't you come down? <laughs> come down. It, 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 that almost seemed like you know temptation you know one or two. That sounds like temptation one or if you're the son of God, all right, command this you know stone to be turned to bread. <laughs> and at the last point, the devil was speaking through those people, mocking him. If Truly, you claim you are the son of God. Come down from the cross so we can believe. Imagine if it were you. You want to prove a point. What would you do? <laughs> Imagine what you would do at that point. Father, let me just finally prove to them. Let me show them once and for all so they can believe. No. 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 You don't need to prove to anybody. Because you're not there to prove to anyone. You're only there to comply in obedience. Father, teach me your ways. Teach me your ways, son. Teach me how to live in obedience. When you're at the best of serving God, that is when you feel neglected, you feel rejected, you feel detected, you feel forsaken, you feel pain, you feel like you're alone. But that is the best time that God reveals himself and shows us his ways and will the most. Job could not comprehend it. Even though Jesus could comprehend what was going on, but he had to voice out the pain of the separation of, the, of, the, of, of his father neglecting him at that crossing time. And that was what ushered him into death. That was what prepared him for the war, for the battle he was going to face. The real war. Remember, the real war was not on the cross. He went to hell. He went to fight 
he went amen yes to 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 reclaim the key of humanity that was snatched from adam in the beginning he had to do it legally he had to follow prescri prescribed order and on the third day he rose do we understand this friends the scenario of what redemption is all about and what the implication of being a disciple of Christ is and means I'm going to stop here friends so we've been talking about the chronicle of a disciple of Christ how to advance the mandate of God's kingdom in Babylon you see it's a different kind of wisdom here this wisdom is totally different from what we have been introduced to, what many of us have learned. This is coming to the place of not by might, not by power. And we need to know what that might and power is so we can appreciate what they are presenting to us. Because if you don't know what might and power is, you may just quote that and tomorrow you go and exercise might and power. And you call it spirituality. Amen, friends? So hopefully God will grant us grace to continue to press into this understanding of the chronicles. At the end of the day, let me say this, at the end of the day, you should be able to start to write down your own chronicles. You need to start to chronicle your own discipleship, your own walk with God. Yes, because I'm just basically giving you a template, I'm giving you a, a preview of what it is, what it means to be a chronicle, to be a disciple, to be one who follow Christ. If you are going to follow him, he said, so this is not for those who are yet to decide. He was speaking to his disciple. Let me quickly run through that scripture again. Then we'll be gone. All right. And then we'll be done. Look at that scripture again. Then Jesus told his disciple. Disciples are not just followers. They were those who were following him for bread, for fish, for food, you know, for healing, for miracle, all of that. Yes. And that's okay. But he wasn't talking to those people. He was talking to those people who have made certain decisions. Yet he raised the bar of that decision. If you want to follow me, he says, you must what? Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Then follow me. Deny yourself one. Take up your cross two. And then make the choice to follow. So, that is where we are. This we are doing in the concept of Bible study to give us a Bible lifestyle to live in Babylon. I hope I have been able to, you know, uh, um, reach you, minister to you with some of the things the Spirit of the Lord has really spoken to us. All right. I will see you again, friends, hopefully uh, um, tomorrow, if the Lord permits us. Thank you so very much for being part of this. We'll see you again. God bless you. Bye-bye.